today uh, I want to talk about some ideas for resolving complex code problems. Um, and I call it complex, but it really uh, you could actually scratch the complex part. Um, and it could be like um, a lot of code problems. Um, and I'm going to use some slides that I made for another meeting yesterday that I didn't actually have time to adapt for today. Um, but um, um, yesterday, I only had half an hour to go to some of this stuff. Uh, so maybe we can expand a bit more um, and also share some other points of view. Um, so uh, part of when you're resolving uh, code problems or code issues is actually um, um, you're going to reach a point where you're going to have to ask for help from others. Right? Um, and so um, once you're... Uh, at that stage where you need help from others. Um, there are several tools and ideas that um, can help uh, you organize your code um, to, uh, uh, to enable others to help you a bit easier um, or faster. Uh, and that process of organizing your code um, can also help you sometimes identify the issue uh, yourself. Um, and so these are some of those strategies for that. Um, we've talked about the Reprex package in the past, and then maybe I'll talk about it also at some point here. But um, this quote that I put here, with power comes great responsibility, I think it's from Spider-Man or the it, I love Spider-Man. Um, uh, I put this quote too because um, if, uh, if you, you know, have um, more knowledge, um, and start customizing some things, then it's gonna, you're then become more responsible for dealing with what you're customizing. Uh, because once you start to customize, you make it harder for everyone else to try to help you. Um, so, um, uh, I mean, sometimes uh, customization is, is good, right? Um, because uh, that's how we make some uh, breakthroughs also. Uh, but if you're asking for help, Sometimes it's best to think about um, how to make everything you have as simple as possible. Um, and so um, in this case, um, let's say you're adapting code that already existed. And if you start to customize that code a lot, then you're gonna introduce more and more differences. And so that will make it harder for other people to identify like, okay, I think, change number one is, is the one introducing the problem, right? Uh, because there's gonna be a lot more things to check. Um, so that's one side. The other thing is if we're working in teams, right? Um, so this, you know, let's say, just as an example, let's say like Luke and I are collaborating, right? Um, and we're using this, um, we're uh, sharing code with each other and maybe even editing the code that both of us wrote. At that point, uh, you need to, there's two uh, tools that can help you a lot in this process. These are really like communication. Um, um, it's kind of like setting the language that you're gonna use to communicate with each other, right? One of them is make, using comments on your code. Um, using comments on your code is gonna help uh, you explain what, you know, what your code is doing to other people. But it's also going to uh, help you in the future for yourself when you um, uh, maybe you have a line of code that it comes out of nowhere and you're like, OK, um, uh, why was that line of code important? Maybe I don't actually need it. Maybe I can delete it. Uh, and if you have a comment there, maybe it will remind you that that line of code was useful. Um, the other thing is uh, standardizing your code. So um, this. Uh, there's some newer tools for this, or I mean, newer in the sense that maybe they've been around for just a couple of years instead of multiple years, um, that can help you in this process, specifically with R. Um, but for any other programming language, there's also tools for that. Um, in the standardizing your code means trying to use some of the same coding style. Um, why, why do we want to try to use the same coding style? Because then, um, uh, 
people will be more familiar with the same coding style and then they'll be able to understand to interpret the code itself without the comments a lot faster right i mean the comments will help a lot but um but just uh, having the same coding style will be quite useful and so uh something that i've been advocating recently is to use the styler package which is part of i mean it's part of the tidyverse type of packages they have a function there called style underscore file where you can give it the file path um and even if you just use it like that that's quite a bit of um, improvement let's say uh, but um in particular um i made a function in the biosc this package called biosc style which you can look at over here at the website for more information uh, um, and so i've been telling people working with me to use this to style their code and to standardize it um, um, so I think that will make some of this process easier. Um, the next thing is uh, a lot of us are working. Hey, on, real, real quick, sure. what, do you, what do you mean by style? So, um, so it would look at the styler package. Um, this will do a lot of things. So. Um, for example, maybe here you have a piece of code, right? That says a equals function, uh, something next, one plus one. This piece of code here works, but it's not as easy to understand um, as, for example, this other piece of code where you have a space equal space the function, um, the x without, you know, the space here then a space separating before the, you know, um, before the curly bracket, and then some spaces around the plus sign. So this makes, um, uh, for your eyes, it makes it easier to see the patterns, right? Because you're like, okay, here I have something that I'm creating, an object. Here I'm, there's something else that I'm doing, which is in this case a function x. And in this particular case, I'm adding, and I can identify easily the two parts that I'm adding, one plus one. Um, um, so, I mean, there's a lot more things that go into this function, into this package, um, but that's part of what this is doing. Um, so, I don't know if you, I mean, you're a Python user, but uh, not everyone else. Uh, you can't, you couldn't write that in Python and it'd be legal if you're doing definitions or functions yeah is, it's more of an that's like an r, slightly of an r issue but i do have yeah. a there so is a style guide for python using the yeah, correct yeah. and stuff yes yeah, so what i wanted to mention was like in python people say like one of the things they love about python is the indentation of code that makes it more human readable so that's kind of in the same vein here where you have like the spaces uh, to help you separate the different logical elements of your code um, um, which, I mean, this is just one line of code, right? But you, you can have a lot of lines of code. Um, and um, the process of reading, let's say, a 200 line R script will be made a lot easier by using this type of stuff, right? Um, that's the idea of it. Um, 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 and well, and then like these bias cities, bias styles for making it a little more like Biconductor friendly. Uh, uh, Biconductor actually has a style guide. So, um, uh, but it's um, remembering how to you know do all of those things is quite a, can take quite a bit of work. So this bias style function kind of help you a little bit in terms of that, um, uh, in terms of automatic indentation and things like that. Um, <clears throat> okay. The next thing is like, uh, because we're working with data that's normally too big for laptops um, or computers, uh, we end up using a lot of um, um, uh, uh, servers or clusters uh, for working with our data. Or, I mean, you could even, you could even be using the cloud. Um, and so this is something that uh, might, might change over time, but I think at this stage uh, in particular, um, uh, it's best to just use a single location for your project. So um, on the Gypsy cluster, for example, 
everyone has a directory under forward slash users than their username. And um, and that's, you know, that's like your, uh, um, that's the directory that they use in the Gypsy orientation. And they're like, oh, this is where you can save some of your files. But we're actually a part um, of the Libre Institute. So we have access to disks that are much larger than the, than the default one uh, on their users. And so um, we tend to use those other disks instead of these users. And so here, I'm, I would highly recommend people to avoid using the user's directory as much as possible for their projects and analysis. Why? Um, there's some details about Gypsy where the, the user's the disk system is a slightly different than the ones we use for, um, for our data. And so, um, uh, you might be running into a complex problem that is disk system dependent. Um, and so in general, you want to, um, avoid that because if you're using, um, a directory in Gypsy and then the user's directory and you're getting different, um, outputs, it might be because of the disk system because, uh, differences. Um, that's, you know, it's a rare scenario, but that's one of the things that can happen. And so again, the idea is to simplify, uh, use, as, use one common framework where everyone is familiar with that framework. Um, and, and so that reduces the number of variables that we need to be checking and concerned about when we're trying to debug some code. Uh, this user's directory is also only limited to 100 gigabytes of disk space, which uh, is, uh, I'm part of the big help mailing list and people forget about this all the time. They're like, oh, I'm trying to run this and like, I don't know what's happening. And then the uh, cluster admins go and look into the files and they're like, oh, well, you're actually out of space. That's why your uh, script is not working anymore, right? So people might forget about this. Um, and because we're working with large data, uh, we can easily um, uh, uh, save files that are bigger than 100 gigabytes or create enough of them. Um, also, if you're using more than one location, this is no longer specified to, to users, but if you're using more than one location in a cluster, you might have the same files in the two different locations, but in each location might have different file permissions. And so that introduces a new variable that you have to take into account for saying like, is it working in location one because I have the right permissions there, but not like working in location two because of the file permissions, right? And so you're adding you're adding new variables there. Um, then uh, we've talked about the here package um, um, in R, but there's also this issue about relative and full paths. So if you're using if you're writing code um, that accesses data in a specific directory, that's where you can start using the here package. Um, and make all, all your paths relative to the project you're working on. Uh, but if you have a combination of full paths and relative paths in your scripts, that can make it confusing for people to read um, your script and to think about the multiple locations of where files live. Um, and so um, um, uh, we might have a full, um, uh, a more in-depth uh, conversation about thinking for uh, how to design um, uh, a coding project and uh, like where files come from um, and adapting like a script from someone else. Um, so I'm recruiting someone from here to try to help me with that presentation. So we'll, um, maybe we'll do that later on. Um, and now one, one reason why people, um, uh, start to use a second location is because maybe they have some permission problems in the first location. And they're like, oh, I can't be doing this stuff. And so then they, they move files to a different location. Maybe they copy them. Maybe they start uh, uh, doing things in the new location. And I think here it's better to ask people to try to resolve those permission issues, those permission issues from the beginning instead of trying to avoid them. Uh, like um, this can happen with like data, for example, like um, let's say I'm generating some data and I uh, provide it to Luca, right? I'm just using Luca as an example, but uh, like let's say I give it to Luca. Um, so maybe Luca copies the data and moves it somewhere else. Uh, but maybe later on I find an issue in the data that I created. So I update the data 
and maybe Luca, maybe there's maybe Luca and I have a miscommunication, and then he doesn't realize that change the data, and he's using an older data set. Right. So there's different technical solutions to try to resolve this. Like uh, you can use links, for example. Um, uh, uh, but in the end, like maybe maybe Luca and I should be working in the same directory. Maybe that's the best path forward. Uh, that way, we we reduce the number of uh, of um, potential pitfalls that we could have. Um, another one is let's um, if uh, we're version controlling our code. Um, so I've mentioned a little bit in the past about Git and GitHub. Um, um, Something that is, uh, this is a bit hard for, and I've seen it with multiple people. This can be a bit hard because um, you feel observed, right? Uh, when you're working with Git and GitHub, you're making, you're saving your changes and you're sharing them with your teammates or even the world, right? And so uh, when people feel observed, they, they're like, oh, um, they want to put their best foot forward. They want to give the best image of themselves, right? Uh, and so, uh, like, that means sometimes people will just want to make a commit. A, a, a git commit is when you save your code, the recent changes you've made. So people just want to make a git commit uh, when they've uh, finally solved the problem that they're working on, right? They might make a lot of changes, and they're like, okay, now I have the my you know the working version that I'm happy with for my code. This is the one I'll share, um, and um, while that's better than doing than not using version control at all, um, I think, uh, and uh, I mean, and I've seen talks from other people that uh, agree with me um, that this is not the best thing to do uh, if you're actually going to be uh, version controlling. Why? Uh, Git commits. You, sh you should think of them as they're being cheap, right? Um, if you have a long Git commit history, that's not a problem. Like uh, people know that uh, it takes a while to figure out the answer to a problem, right? And so if you had to try 20 different things to solve the problem, that's okay. Um, um, and actually uh, having that granular detail of what are the things we're doing can help other people um, 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 uh, help you, right? Um, now you do you are actually sharing with the world in a sense, uh, or at least with your teammates. So you do you do need to be aware that um, other people will read your commit messages, and so you have to make them descriptive. You have to make them understandable by other people. I've seen a lot. Um, sometimes when we have uh, people applying for jobs at Beaver, I look at their Git um, repositories, and maybe they have a lot of curse curse words in their Git commit history. Maybe they just say, uh, update this, update this, fix that. And that's their full message. And they have 20, 30 commits that say, fix this, update this. Um, and so that type of message is not useful at all for other people that are going to try to work with you. Um, also, this is kind of like the, co the comments on your code. You're going to come to them back in the, in the future. And, uh, and if you have, you know, details of what you were thinking when you made the change in your code, that's going to help you understand your code later on. And it's actually going to help others, right? So I would think of them as um, documentation, really. Um, um, and uh, uh, you should, I encourage people to make as many commits as they need. Um, and that's, I mean, I, I do this myself. Um, and um, um, like, don't worry that other people will get a lot of messages. That's that's okay. Um, now, because we're putting such a focus on the Git history and um, and making it, you know, something that you're sharing with your team, um, Git actually, um, uh, although it has commands for resetting the history, uh, there's you should actually avoid doing this as much as possible. You only need to do it on under very specific circumstances. So, for example, um, let's say that you committed a file to your Git history that has uh, some passwords or uh, private data, uh, or some really big files that you later on realize that you don't actually want to share. Um, 
So at that point, there's tools that can help you uh, remove those files. And at that point, I think um, that's the only point that I think it's okay to alter the Git history. But you should never be using Git reset. Um, um, even if you're, um, um, uh, let's say you make a change and then you want to go back to the past, there's other commands in Git that will allow you to go back to the past but keep the Git history. Um, so actually when you run this tool called the uh, EFG, uh, which I always think is like Bigfoot, um, um, uh, when you use this tool at some point, there's a message that shows up that says like, um, well, this, well, I mean, they, it has, it's a political message that says like, oh, Trump is trying to alter history. You should not let him do it. <laughs> Just like you're not allowed to alter and get history. Uh, um, but anyway, um, uh, um, this is also uh, an area where you start to alter the history, you end up then customizing more and more. And if you're then customizing more and more, then you're gonna uh, make your, you know, you have more power, right? But then you have more responsibility to try to figure out what went wrong because others, other people won't be able to help you as easily. Um, I think there's a couple of chat messages. Uh, uh, that's just me being a troll. <laughs> uh, that's okay. Uh, Ignore. Is that a, like I'm not seeing them normally. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> let me see. Okay. The next one I have is um, you want to document what you're doing through code. What do I mean by this? Right. So um, um, the the if I just open like our studio, right? Let me open one of them here. Um, I could like try a couple things, right? I could be like, oh, let's uh, uh, log like ggplot, oops, uh, ggplot2, and then uh, um, I could make a plot here. Um, um, I don't remember where the variables for empty cars, um, that's either, I think. Yeah. So I can make a plot and stuff, right? Um, I can make a plot and then maybe I like take a screenshot or save it to PDF and share it with someone, right? But maybe someone later on comes and is like, Leo, uh, you know, um, I like your plot, but can you add, um, can you make the points larger, right? And so at that point, um, at that point, you know, that's, uh, let's say a month later or something, um, and, uh, or even just a couple days later, and if I didn't save the code, they're like, I need to be like, okay, what did I do? I need to remember that I like um, loaded the ggplot2 package. And then I might need to think um, again about how I wrote that code. Um, and so doing this is um, error prone because I might not remember that I was loading, um, that what is using ggplot, for example, or exactly how I wrote the code. Um, in this scenario, like, my example is not fully complete because I can still see my previous code, right? And so I can copy paste it and edit it. So that's the same idea that I'm, I'm sorry. So one way that you can address this is by making an R script. You make an R script and then that's where you write your code um, for making the plot. Um, So I can save this code into a file. Um, and then later on, you know, a month from now, someone is like, oh, we actually like your plot. We want to add it to the paper, but can you make it uh, a bigger? So I could just go back to my code and then uh, record my change, right? Um, 
and then make uh, make the plot a bit bigger uh, or things like that. Um, um, you know, that's a bit more readable, for example, right? Um, but this was done, this is, this scenario is um, made a lot simpler and possible because I, I, I documented what it did on code, right? And you might think like, oh, this, you know, this example seems kind of silly because, um, you know, you're writing our code and uh, I mean, that's why we've, we've been using our scripts for all of this. But um, this actually also applies to things that may or beyond R. So let's say your project involves um, creating some files or creating some directories. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe you're trying to, um, to solve a problem and you're running the same code multiple times. And so, because you're running the same example code multiple times, you're deleting your, your files, your output files, um, uh, every time you run, you want to run your test. And so, in this scenario, maybe you could, um, uh, you could actually document those steps into a small script that says, for example, here, I'm going to make a directory called trash. This is bash command. These are bash commands. Maybe I'm going to move the file that I just created, uh, the file that I just created into that trash, move the corresponding log file into the trash, and then run my, my code. Um, and so this, even though it's just like four lines of code, uh, documenting this and putting it into a small script will be quite useful. Uh, or let's say that um, if we go back to the scenario where I'm, I'm giving Lucas some data and he is copying the data somewhere else, he could have a little script that says like, this is the command for copying the data. And so the next time later on that I tell him like, oh, I updated the data, he can run that little script and copy the data automatically without having to remember, you know, where did the data live? You know, look through all our emails from the past and be like, oh, this is where I, Leo told me where the data was. Let me copy it again, so, right? So even small things, you should try to put them into, um, into, um, into script files. Uh, and let's say you're doing this after having made, um, after already having some scripts. So at that point, I will look at your uh, R code and look for dir.create or save commands or PDF commands or bash scripts where you have mkdir or log files. And those that maybe are the files you want to put into your small script that uh, reruns your test. Um, and so by putting into code, then you're also then making uh, whatever steps you did reproducible. And, uh, and you're documenting them for other people to understand exactly what are the things you're doing. And if we're talking about complex problems, um, this can be quite useful. Um, because um, um, then you don't need to tell me like Leo after you run the script then you need to do um, these more these other three steps right because I know that um, that little piece of that small script with four lines of code tells me exactly what are the things it did right um, and I can see the order in which it did them sometimes for complex problems the order really matters and like um, this there's an example that I've used in the past which was um, um, this was a problem that Matt had involved in some of our uh, Gypsy modules, and the order in which some lines of code were executed really mattered because one of the steps was erasing some information. Um, uh, in, in that particular case, it was erasing a, an environment variable. Um, so um, all of this is about like okay, making it reproducible and and and, uh, and really like. Um, Saving into files, saving into your Git history, into your Git, into your comments, your code, all your thoughts, right? You're, you're basically like transferring as much knowledge as you can um, uh, to other people in an organized uh, way. The other thing is like, um, let's say you're, you know, this is maybe um, more specific to, to um, scenarios where you're uh, doing analysis uh, in parallel. Um, and in that case, you, wanna, you might want to be looking for patterns. So um, one difference, one big difference is if you're using uh, the Gypsy cluster or any uh, high performance computing cluster, there might be big differences between running um, code interactively. So for that, uh, for us, that's the QRSH command on, at Gypsy. 
or uh, non-interactively to the qsubmit command. Uh, there are some big differences here sometimes. One of them is like uh, qsub is actually going to create a log file. And maybe you specify that that file should live in a specific directory. And if that directory doesn't exist, then qsub will be like, eh, I can't do anything. And, but it won't give you an error message that it's useful. It won't be like, oh, you didn't create the log files directory. You should create it before you run this. It won't, it won't be a message like that. It will be like, oh, I'm stuck. And then you're like, okay, why are you stuck, right? <laughs> um, um, so that's one issue there. Another one is uh, when you run uh, things with QSub, you could enable the option to get emails from the cluster management system. And in those emails, there's gonna be some information about how much memory your, um, your um, job was using. It's called the max VMEM, max virtual memory. And one thing that I do is when I'm having errors, I will check if that number is similar to the one that is specified as my hard virtual memory limit, HVMIM. Um, and if they're similar, then I'm like, oh, I'm running into memory problems, right? Uh, but um, that you might not actually get an error message that says like, oh, you, you're out of memory. It's just at that point, I might notice that I'm actually running out of memory. Also, one problem that like we multiple of us have had is that uh, QSub and QSH um, are different uh, in the sense that QSub is stricter with the resources that you're using. When you're submitting a job in a non-interactive way to the cluster, you have to specify all the resources that you're going to use, like how much memory you're going to use, how many cores you're going to use, and um, and um, there's uh, the SunGrid engine has tools for checking that. And so one big difference is, for example, you're, you're using the data.table package. That package will try to use as many threads as available. And so when you're running things interactively, it might be like, oh, you have 64, you have 48, you have, I don't know, 24 threads available, and it will try to use all of them. Well, that's okay in QRSH. I mean, technically speaking, it's not okay because, um, uh, but some read engine is not able to detect that it's not okay um, on their QRSH. On their QSub, it's able to detect that something wrong is happening, and then it will be like, hey, I'm going to stop you right there. Um, and so that's one issue there. Um, I was mentioning also looking for patterns because, um, oh, maybe you're getting like 12 output files, and you're like, oh, why are those 12 output files? Oh, but you're also using 12 cores, so maybe something is happening there. Maybe we can look into that specific. That's a big hint that something is happening at the parallelization step. Um, 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 so something you can do at that point is like, okay, maybe I'm testing with too many cores at a time. Maybe I need to reduce it to, instead of 12, to just one core or maybe two cores uh, where I give it a lot, maybe more memory per core. And that depends on whether you're having memory problems from above, right? Um, um, and again, this is also more useful for the parallelization scenario, which is, I guess, one of those complex scenarios. Um, but if you're parallelizing code, you might have objects in memory that are quite big. And so you can list with LS your objects in your R session. And then there's this uh, R package uh, by, I think it's by Halluitan, uh, Pi R. Um, um, maybe it's not. Yeah, it is by him. Um, um, and actually, the art core thing. Ah, interesting. Um, so that little package has one function that I use a lot, which is called the object underscore size function. Um, that function will tell you how big in memory your object is. Um, it's actually more precise than the base function in R. Um, especially if you have some of the memory loaded to a C object. Um, um, but uh, anyway, this function here is useful to see how big your data is in memory. And if you're parallelizing something, that might be the cause of the problem. Because let's say you're parallelizing something um, uh, and you're using um, 10 gigabytes of memory per core but you already loaded a single object that is like, let's say 15 gigabytes of, of memory. If you loaded that big object, then initially when you're just using one, one core, right? 
let's say you're, you're using 10 of them, so you have 100 gigs, right, of memory. So 15 out of 100, you're still okay. But at the moment when you start to run stuff in parallel, that 15 gets multiplied by 10. So now you have 150 gigs, and you only requested 100. Um, and so at that point, your code might crash. And it's not going to crash with a very informative error at that point. Um, now, OK, like maybe here you're running into something that's happening in the parallelization step. And so I recommend people to use the biasy parallel package from Bioconductor. And one of the reasons I highly recommend using this package is that it has um, an argument uh, for the parallelization functions called BP param. For BP is for biasy parallel. And then param is for parameter. That argument allows you to change how your code is being run without actually having to rewrite it. So there's a function there called serial param, which will run things exactly um, as you were running them yourself on a, let's say, L apply loop um, on a very, uh, um, basically like a for loop um, type of scenario. Um, um, and so I, that can help you identify um, issues with the code that you're parallelizing over. Um, um, I mean, and it gets a bit more complicated than that, but um, this the package has a lot of utilities there. Um, and so this one, I, I put it in the wrong line, but if you find objects that are really big in memory and they're not, you, you don't actually need them for the code that you're running in parallel, you can just remove them with R before using uh, biasy parallel apply. So this, you know, this gets a bit more specific in parallelization, but that's one of those complex issues. But uh, one, one thing that is more general is um, uh, if you're debugging something and you're like, okay, I don't know why my code is not doing this thing I expected it to do, what you might need is more information. And so at that point, it's basically the same thing as uh, uh, as commits being cheap. Information, printed information, should be cheap too. It doesn't matter if your log file is five kilobytes or uh, ten megabytes. In the end, that doesn't really affect us in any way, right? So you print as much information as you think you will need uh, that can help you. Um, especially if you're running something uh, uh, non-interactively. And so some functions that are quite useful for that are uh, the message function. Um, I, in particular, like using, uh, let me just make this bigger. Um, um, I like using the message function with like the cease time, coupled with cease time. Uh, Uh, I like doing that quite a bit because it prints, you know, the date and the actual time in the computer, and then you know some message there. Um, and I do that quite a bit because sometimes what I need is information about how long different steps are taking. So maybe that's I, uh, uh, you know, if I see on my log file that like, uh, let's see, like. Um, almost 25 seconds pass between this step and that step, I know that like whatever code I was running between those messages takes around 25 seconds to run. Right? And this is it. maybe 25 seconds doesn't really matter, but like there could be scenarios where it takes an hour or 15 minutes or something. And you want to know that your code is still uh, you know, doing something. Um, um, and so those messages can be quite helpful. Um, and I, Typically combine them with print messages. So I might be like, oh, hello. And then I'm going to print. Um, some information. Um, and so in my log file, what I'll see is I'll see it says here like, oh, hello. And then it has some numbers. And I did I do this because a log file is different from the R console. The R console here, you can see the code that I ran and the output. But a log file will look not like that, but it will look, it won't include the R commands. Um, it will only include the output. So then I can be like, oh, okay, 
this is the corresponding number for my message that says hello, right? Um, I mean, in this case, it's a lot of numbers, but um, uh, that will be more useful because like, let's say later on, I'm also printing another summary. Um, and if I just see, you know, a bunch of numbers and then another bunch of numbers in my log file, I might not know what I'm referring to, but if I, if I pair them with messages saying like, okay, I'm looking at hello and then hello too, now I can identify and trace back what these numbers are related to based on my script. Um, another function I recommend people use is the stop if not function. Um, so let's say um, I'm gonna plot, I have my plotting function um, here. Uh, let's say here I'm, I'm, I'm plotting um, um, empty cars, right? But maybe I want to check that actually empty cars has uh, some information. So I could be like, stop if not, uh, let's say all MPG and cylinder um, if those two variables are in the column names of my data set. So this is getting too wide. Um, and so what does this function do, stop if not? Well, it's gonna uh, end the execution of your R code unless whatever is inside the parenthesis is a true. Uh, if I have a false scenario, then it will fail, right? Um, so oops. Uh, this can be useful, for example, I'm just gonna make an error here. If I'm saying like, oh, if I was expecting my data set to have the columns MPG2 and then cylinder, it'll be like, okay, we have an error here. And why do you wanna be using this? Well, at some point, um, I mean, R has a lot of error messages, but some of them are not very informative, right? And so that's actually the problem with some of these complex um, uh, problems that we're trying to solve. Um, the error messages might not be informative. And so one way to try to address that is by making some error messages yourself. And so this stuff, if not, is, a, is one of the uh, shorter syntax for making error messages yourself. And you're just gonna check, you know, does my data have the columns that I'm expecting it to have? If not, give me an error and then if you see this error message on the log file, that will be way more informative than something that says like, oh, my PDF is empty. My plot that I made is empty. Um, why was that, right? Is, you know, what was the error? And then maybe the error was that my, uh, my table didn't have the columns that I was expecting it to have, right? Um, um, the other one is using the, the dim function, dimension function. And this one I use, I recommend printing it the combination of, combination of message and print, um, especially when you're filtering an object. And this can be quite um, important when, um, let's say you're using the match function. So um, let's say I wanna match, you know, uh, A and B, and I'm matching them to something else that only has X and Y. Um, so a lot of times you'll see code like this where we're saving it into an object like this, so you call it M. And then I want to, um, uh, let me make it a little table. Oops. Let's say um, you know matching something, and then I want a subset to whatever match. Um, um, so in this case, I'm going to edit my code and just that thing. Um, 
So what happens here, right? Um, the first 10 letters are not you know, present in X and Y, right? So when I run the match, function is only giving me any values. But maybe, you know, when I wrote this code and I was testing it interactively, it was giving me actual numbers. And so then I subset something, um, my table to that information. And now I have a table that only has NAs. And maybe my plotting function later on is like, okay, I don't know what's happening with all these NAs, right? And so at this point, after subsetting, I would recommend doing something like this. Message. This time. Um, Where you say like, okay, I'm subsetting, uh, and then print the dimensions after subsetting. Like this scenario, maybe it's not as informative because I still get like ten rows, um, but maybe that it, maybe those numbers will be informative for me later on to notice that there's something uh, something going on. Um, just there are other scenarios where you can end up with something that is actually you're subsetting something that is null. And then at that point, you might be like, oh, wait, uh, I got something that I wasn't expecting, right? I got something that has zero rows when I was expecting at least one row type of thing. Um, so all that, all that information that you might need for debugging, you know, I would uh, recommend that you add it to your scripts. Um, it doesn't matter that your log file is getting longer. Um, um, and maybe later on you realize that some of the checks you you added were not as useful, uh, but maybe some of them are, right? So um, I would just be liberal here and include as much information as you want. For uh, this particularly is useful in the case where if you're running things interactively, everything works, but when you're running things non-interactively, it's not working. And so that's one of those complex scenarios. Um, and you will, then you want to print as much information. Or maybe just test it with one or two genes, let's say, and you're running it with like a thousand genes later, um, and then maybe five of those genes are failing, and you want to understand why those five genes are failing. And at that information, at that point, information might be useful. Um, and so the last slide I have is you want to avoid also some common pitfalls. So one thing is uh, when you're running things to interact, um, sorry, not interactive, when you're submitting things to the cluster, uh, it's going to create a log file. It's automatically is going to create two log files, one for what's called the standard error and another one for what's called the standard output. Um, and there's actually options in the Q sub command that will make you uh, use a single file. Why do you want a single log file? Well, um, these two things might get assigned to different, um, um, to different strings. Or if you have an error message, you might get assigned to another one. And so if you have two log files and one of them has, you know, let's say this line of output, and the other one has these two lines of output, then it makes it really hard for you to try to pair them together, right? Uh, so that's where, where combining them into one can be quite useful. Um. <laughs> Look at how to leave, and we'll use even this example more. Um, another one that I've noticed quite a bit is people will hard code uh, 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 columns or rows that they're subsetting in their code. So, for example, here they're like, oh, I just want columns one and three, right? And maybe in your scenario, column one was Ola and column three was high, and you're like, oh, you know, everything works. But maybe the data changes, right? And then now it's columns two and four, for example, because maybe I added a new first column. Um, and so at that point, your code will no longer work and you need to manually check that you actually, that the, you need to load the previous data and the new data, identify that the column order change and then, um, um, uh, and then actually adapt your code for that. So, for that type of scenario, I would recommend using something like this, where you save whatever the, the columns that you're interested in into an object, and then subset using that object. You could even add the stop if not step to check that all the variables are actually in your column. 
um, in your in your table. The last one is to always include your R session information, and that info that can be quite useful for some of these complex scenarios. Some of these complex scenarios can be related to um, different versions of R, um, and maybe different versions of uh, versions of packages, right? Um, and so that will be very like application dependent. Um, and, uh, um, and this function in particular, the, the uh, 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 goal is getting in my way. Um, the session underscore info function from the session info package is the one that I recommend the most because um, it provides you information about where you install packages from GitHub that the base R function doesn't provide. And that information can be very useful because ultimately like the, the GitHub um, the number that you have, the GitHub uh, ID that you have is basically the version, the most detailed version number for a package that you install from, the, from, the, from GitHub. Um, um, and that's something, for example, that Nick Eagles and I uh, are gonna try to provide in like the speakeasy pipeline because people might install uh, or suffer from multiple, in multiple periods of time and the GitHub ID will be the most specific version number at that point. Um, and so uh, this R session information becomes more important when you're working with uh, packages that are under active development. Um, uh, and that might be the case for some of the work we're doing with like um, with uh, packages that are um, you know uh, on the cutting edge and people are um, working on them, um, but it could also happen with like some um, some mainstream packages, right? Like for example, um, Palplot, which is a package that is used a lot by people that are using ggplot, had a pretty big change at some point. Um, um, and you and like let's say maybe maybe you're not aware of that change, but then I see it on the verse in the session information, and I'm like, oh, you actually have a pack, you know. You need to update your cowpot cow pot package because now in this new version they fixed that a problem that existed before or something like that. Um, and if you don't include that information, it's impossible to remember it, right? Like, like, like you know, even right now, like I didn't do much, but uh, I already have a bunch of uh, uh, packages loaded um, just from loading um, ggplot2 and. Um, I'll never remember that, you know, this stuff I did on version R4.0 with like ggplot2 version 3.3.2. Like who remembers that stuff, right? So that's why you should uh, try to save it all, all the time. Um, um, cool. Um, so those are the things that I had. I'm gonna, let me stop recording. Um.